adjudicate. In fact, we had one I announced on the radio the other, uh, last Friday. Uh, an adjudication came in on the uh, Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Everybody voted against it. It's been adjudicated for alteration and abolishment. And now I figure there's a few people in Colorado. Since it's legal, right? We didn't make the declaration. They, yeah, it says alter and abolish. So there'll be a few people on that disappearing or leaving or changing their program. You know, as Christians, we can give them a pat on the head or a kick in the ass. I'm the kick in the ass. There you go. They gave us the law. We're the only country in the world that can say. If they don't do what we ask, we have the right to alter and abolish the government officials. So why haven't we been doing it for a hundred years? That's my question. I always ask them people, I said, I didn't write this stuff. It was written 240 years ago. And why is, and then why are secularists taking over since then?
Okay. Just well, thank you. Thanks for coming up and saying hi. I'll be on for a couple of days in February. I don't have the dates offhand, but uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, Mandy's gone a lot more than I expected, so I probably did a total of five weeks filling in for her in 2018. So that, that's fine. Part time is all I want to do after 35 years of five day a week radio. So. Well, except for the ones that hate my guts. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, thanks for coming. Randy, how you doing? Good to see you, sir. Looking well. You look well, too. What station are you on? 710.
college yeah. equitably so we can get the doctors, the lawyers, and the started so grab a seat and we're going to get started with our evening friends welcome to our january 2019 distinguished lecture series tonight's topic the challenges with government-run education a non-controversial topic yeah. if this <laughs> if this is your first time welcome to our monthly lecture series where we explore some of the most pressing issues from a christian conservative perspective to begin our evening, please welcome 1776 scholars Mira Hughes and Sam Blanker to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance in the prayer. If you can, please stand with us. God, I thank you so much that we can come together and have this time of fellowship and discussion. And God, amongst such a controversial topic, uh, I ask that you fill this room with your Holy Spirit, God. Let, uh, let your fire be in all of our souls and just let us, um, God, let us just discuss what you need us to discuss and see what you need us to see. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Could you please join me in saying the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. All right, thank you. Those are our 1776 scholars. Those are students here at Colorado Christian University. And friends, I think we are raising up the next generation of wonderful, conservative, godly leaders here at CCU. You know, when Bill Armstrong passed, I wrote in uh, tribute to him. I said, Bill's genius was that at the end of his career, after he'd been a senator and a congressman and had served the state of Colorado, he came here at CCU and created a place where we could repli replicate 10,000 more Bill Armstrongs out of this university. And I think that's, that's our hope, and you can see with these young, talented minds that we're doing that here at CCU. 
Well, friends, government-run education in Colorado is facing some serious challenges. A record number of Colorado families are now choosing homeschool and charter schools. <laughs> According to U.S. News and World Report, four out of the five top-performing high schools in Colorado are charter schools. Senator Ben Sass criticized government-run education as an effort to, quote, homogenize our kids. Faith leader Jim Dobson from Focus on the Family, who created that, said, quote, today public schools don't offer much in the way of values education, and if they do, it's often wrong. Some even believe that what goes on in public schools can be harmful to a student's development and learning. Still, a vast majority of Coloradans choose government-run education for their children. How does Colorado improve education? What are the hurdles and challenges facing policymakers, educators, and parents? Should Colorado take steps to embrace vouchers and provide religious school choice for parents? How do we achieve the best education for Coloradans? And I think that's why this is such a hot topic. We all care about children. We all care about the next generation. And we want what's best for them. We want to equip them to be successful citizens. How best do we do that? Well, tonight we're going to hear from an esteemed group of panelists, all with different uh, areas of expertise. We're going to hear from Dr. Deb Scheffel, who is the Dean of the School of Education right here at Colorado Christian University. She represents District 4 on the Colorado State Board of Education. And I'm going to brag a little bit about Deb Scheffel. The National Council on Teacher Quality released its national rankings for 717 baccalaureate programs in secondary education, specifically on career preparation for future high school teachers. So how well do these college programs prepare future teachers. They named the secondary education program here at Colorado Christian University School of Education as one of only 16 programs in the nation to receive the exclusive top tier designation. Can we give Deb Scheffel a round of applause? <laughs> Deb Scheffel is really preparing some of Colorado's best teachers to go forth into the state and make a difference uh, for our young people. Uh, next, just to the uh, left of her, is Derek Schuler, who is the executive director of Ascent Classical Academies, a classical charter school program with schools in Jefferson and Douglas counties, and he's partner partnered with Hillsdale College in the creation of these charter schools in, in Colorado and doing a wonderful service for our communities. Let's welcome Derek Schuler. <laughs> next to Derek Schuler is the legendary Mike Rosen, a radio personality, political commentator, and author. He was the host of the Mike Rosen Show on talk radio station 850 KOA in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Mike Rosen is a former member of the Jefferson County Board of Education and a wonderful activist here in Jefferson County to keep school or to keep uh, the choice of education with parents. Uh, let's thank and welcome Laura Boggs. <laughs> Each of us is going to begin by making a few opening remarks, and then I'll, take a, then I'll ask a series of questions, and then we'll turn it over to the crowd so you can ask questions as well of our panelists. But as you saw, we each cover a different area. You have State Board of Education, you have an educator, political commentator, and a local activist. Um, and so I think you'll get a variety of different perspectives when it comes to uh, education in the state. But before we begin, I think it's important to get our terms in order. There's a lot of happening with education in Colorado, and it's important to understand exactly what we're talking about when I say government-run education. First, let's start with homeschooling. Homeschooling is the process of teaching one's children in the home instead of sending them to a school. Homeschooling provides learning outside of the public or private school environment. Colorado has roughly 26,000 homeschooled children, or 3% of all the children enrolled in, public edu or in education in Colorado. Private schools are schools founded, conducted, and maintained by a private group rather than by the government, usually charging tuition and often following a particular philosophy or viewpoint. We have religious private schools here in Colorado, and we have non-religious private schools. There are 60,690 students enrolled in 430 private schools in the state of Colorado, just under 7% of the state's total school-aged population. Then we have government-funded but parent-run schools, otherwise known as charter schools. They are public schools that are independently run. It receives greater flexibility over operations in exchange for increased performance accountability. The school is established by a charter, which is a performance contract describing key elements of the school. 
The charter contract describes things like the school's mission, instructional program, governance, personal, personnel, finance, plans for student enrollment, and how they're all to be measured. In Colorado, there are 250 charter schools serving 120,000 students. Now what's interesting is that these charter schools in Colorado are actually more racially diverse than the overall public schools in this, or overall government run schools in, the Col in Colorado and make up about 13% of total enrollment. In fact, if you took all the charter school kids in the state of Colorado and put them together, they'd be the largest school district in the state. And then we have neighborhood schools or government funded and government run schools, what we typically think of as public schools now recognize that charters are also public schools, they're government funded, they're just run by parents. But our neighborhood schools are any elementary or secondary educational institution operated by a state, subdivision of a state, or government agency within a state, or operated wholly or predominantly from or through the use of government funds or property taxes. So the title of tonight's event was Challenges Facing Government-Run Schools, not necessarily government-funded schools, but government-run schools. These are our traditional neighborhood schools. And we're going to focus on them because they make up primarily 80% of all enrollment of kids in the state of Colorado. So a little bit personal background on myself. I was uh, educated in public uh, neighborhood schools in the Cherry Creek School District. I was a graduate of Cherry Creek in 2000. Uh, my kids attended uh, neighborhood schools in Douglas County until we moved them over to charter schools. And my role tonight is to help facilitate, but I'm also passionate about this issue because I'm a dad and I have four young kids that are in school right now and I've seen some challenges to government run education. So I'm gonna come at this from a very personal perspective. But where are the challenges that I see? Well, primarily two major challenges that I wanna address from my perspective. One is the quality of the curriculum and what these kids are being taught. In Ben Sass's book, The Vanishing American Adult, Sass eviscerates John Dewey and modern education. Sass says that the school is no longer there to support parents, but to replace them. And I think that is absolutely key to understand about our modern education system. The entire point of school is to advance, quote, social progress, not necessarily educate. Everything in a child's life should center on the modern school is what modern school believes. Dewey said, who framed and created the modern school system, said there is no God, there is no soul, hence there is no need for the props of traditional religion, there is no room for fixed or natural law or permanent moral absolutes. School is primarily about training the next generation of social justice warriors. And I was concerned when I saw that the values and the principles that were being taught to my kids were not just kind of different, but totally opposed to the values and principles that I was teaching my kids at home. And that's a real challenge for modern neighborhood schools. And I think it's creating a generation of kids that don't necessarily embrace the facts and embrace truth, but they embrace social justice. There's a Fox News op-ed today. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is the voice of an ignorant generation. But I think she's a generation that came up through that whole system, that it's about her values and you see them lived out and not necessarily the values of truth, of, of, uh, of, of what we care deeply about here. Instead, you get what Dewey said, that there is no God, there is no soul, there's no natural law, there's no permanent moral absolutes. Instead, there's just ever-changing progressivism. I also want to point out, in, problematic to this, is a latest bill that was just introduced this week at the State House of Representatives, Re Representatives right down there in Denver, on comprehensive sex education that explicitly bans the teaching of religious perspectives on human sexuality. Not, not endorses it, and I understand that schools can't necessarily endorse a particular viewpoint when it comes to human sexuality. There's a lot of different viewpoints. But the fact that they can't even teach it demonstrates to me that they're not interested in, quote, comprehensive sexual education, right? It's kind of oxymoronic that you'd keep that out. But what's fascinating to me is that a majority of the world's population looks at sexu human sexuality through the lens of religion, whether you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, 
a vast majority of the world looks at proper human sexuality relationships through the terms of religion. And kids here in Colorado aren't even going to be taught that. It's going to be put our heads in the sand and, and, and act like it never exists. The other challenge I have is with what I feel like are low expectations. According to US News and World Report, four out of the top five performing high schools in Colorado are charter schools. And I'm going to speak specifically from the position of a dad. We took our kids out of our neighborhood schools, which was Douglas County, arguably the greatest neighborhood schools that you can have in the state of Colorado. And when I saw classical education for the first time, I saw high expectations uh, that, were, that were expected of our kids in a way I had never been exposed to before. I had no idea how great education could be until I saw it. When I saw it, I was shocked. And I kind of want to get this message out to parents all over the state of Colorado. There's a better way. My kids now wear uniforms. Not saying that all kids have to wear uniforms, but my kids wear uniforms. They're expected to greet their teacher. They're expected to stand up when an adult walks in. Uh, they have higher expectations on reading, on math, on science, on history, on art. Everything's at a higher level. But what I love most about this is that they're teaching not just information, but character and values. And we've lost that in our public education system. The idea that there's a set permanent moral truths and values that should be communicated to the next generation, that's almost absent from our neighborhood schools. And, uh, and so I think we need to make a change on that. So what are my outlines for turning education around in Colorado? Well, we're each going to cover different aspects. But from the point of a parent, I am deeply concerned that we are losing a fundamental value in the state of Colorado that parents know what's best for their kids. And I'm seeing it happen as we try to move away from approving charter schools. I've sat in Douglas County school board meetings where the school board members went back and forth wondering how they're going to restrict charters and force kids back into neighborhood schools. Could you imagine? We don't operate a free economy or marketplace like that at all. If your business is losing customers as parents are moving to charters and to homeschooling, the question to you isn't, how do I force parents to take their kids back to those schools? It's how do we adjust our schools because the parents are voting with their feet to go to something better? And that's the question that we need to be asking. But instead, the Douglas County School Board and Jefferson County School Board and Derek's dealt with this with Adams County School Board and Boulder County School Board, they're not respecting the rights of parents to choose the best education for their parents. They want the government to choose the best education for their parents. And just like Ben Sass said, they don't want to come alongside and help parents. They want to replace parents. Secondly, if we wanted to unleash education overnight in the state of Colorado, we need to change our funding system and allow kids to go to the school that they want, whether that's religious or not. It's called backpack funding. Allow the kid to go to the best school that the parents feel like is the best for their kids. We have this magic thing that happens in the state of Colorado when you turn 18 years old. When you turn 18, you can take a government grant or a scholarship, and you can go to any school that you want. You can come here to Colorado Christian University. You can go to Regis. They have a Buddhist school in Boulder. You can go up there. You can go to CU, CSU. It's really up to you. But if you're 17 years old, you have to go to one of the pre-approved government-run schools or government-funded schools. That's a, that's a problem. We need to allow parents and children to be able to go to the best schools, whether that's religious or not. And we need to open up that opportunity. Uh, we've often heard from our friends on the left that we should be more like Sweden. Well, Sweden has that type of backpack funding where they allow kids to go to those schools that they want to, whether it's religious or not. And then finally, and probably most importantly, friends, we need to be involved in public education. Parents need to be involved in publication. You cannot just drop your kid off at school and expect that they're going to have the same values, the same high expectations, that they're going to be taught what you want them to be taught. You need to be involved in the classroom. You need to be involved in the curriculum. You need to be involved on PTA. We cannot turn education over to the government entirely. We need to stay involved. It is your responsibility to educate your children. It is your primary responsibility, not the government's. So in summary, we need to trust parents. We need to allow children to go to the best school for them, regardless of religion. And parents need to be engaged. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the dean of the School of Education here, Deb Scheffel.
What a great introduction. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you for coming tonight. My name is Deborah Shefflin. As Jeff nicely introduced me, I'm Dean of the School of Education here at CCU and also serve on the State Board of Education. Uh, I'd like to thank Jeff for putting this panel together. It's wonderful to serve with all these other uh, uh, well-prepared and robust panel participants. Um, how many educators do we have in the room? People that are in education, very many. Excellent, thank you for coming. I'd like to say that first and foremost, I'm an educator. I started out teaching in Douglas County as a teacher of students with special needs, and I've done, uh, worked in many schools and also done a lot of work in teacher preparation to prepare teachers to be successful, to go in every classroom and work with every child so that they can fulfill their potential. So I have a great heart for kids, for education, and for those teachers that love other people's children every day and do a wonderful job, and I appreciate the teaching profession so very much. It impacts our state and our nation in profound ways. Uh, I'd like to, when we, when we think um, just of the critique of, of government-run education, much of it has, has really um, circled around two concepts. One is inequality of opportunity, and the second one is the burden of bureaucracy. Since the 1950s, the federal government has tried to achieve equity in programs that have been very expensive, such as Head Start, Title I, special education, but we still have very... Um, a problematic achievement levels for kids in Colorado and across the nation. The National Assessment of Educational Progress estimates that 63% of fourth graders perform at a basic or below basic level in reading, and 69% achieve at those same levels in mathematics. So we're spending a lot on education, and we're not getting what we really need in many cases for those dollars. The second criticism is often around the idea of layers of bureaucracy so that schools are burdened by paperwork, regulation, and often that tends to be tied to agendas of many stakeholders with diverse uh, priorities, and that can lead to real fragmentation in education. Of course, we know that the ground for government participation in education is very historic. You know, we want general education for good citizenship, a stable and democrats democratic society is not really possible without widespread acceptance of some common sets of values. Our question is, are we getting that through our education system? And then a minimum degree of literacy so that citizens have knowledge and skills to make good choices when it comes to voting. And the gain is, you know, to the family, to the child, and certainly to society as a whole. But the question is, uh, around the role of government, the extent to which, and how do they administer and finance education. So when I think of three challenges, uh, the first is a heavy regulatory and compliance bur burden. The system is often not set up in spite of many wonderful teachers in the system of education. As Jeff said, 80% of our students go to traditional schools. And so who is teaching them? Many wonderful teachers. But the system itself is set up with a very heavy regulatory burden that often is compliance driven and not quality driven to meet the needs of individual students. The um, Reg federal and state agencies have often been referred to as the fourth branch of government. If you look at the Department of Education in, in Colorado alone and look at the number of full-time equivalent people that work there, it's grown exponentially over the last 10 years, tracking the legislation that's been passed in Colorado so that there's just lots of people that need to administer those laws. So the regulatory burden is problematic. When we look back to the uh, original Department of Education at the federal level before it was a cabinet level entity in 1867, it was merely designed to collect information and be about research and development, what works. But it, since then, it's had a very heavy regulatory impact, particularly due to Title I funding through the 1965 Elementary and Secondary Education Act, federal aid to disadvantaged students, and now the Department of Education is a, has the third largest budget in the federal government, second only to defense and health and human services. So it has a huge impact in terms of regulatory burden, and it, it often weighs down the system in ways that don't translate into great outcomes for our students, as we see with the, the data, achievement data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Secondly, centralization. Over the past 100 years, in 1939, for example, we've had, we had 117,000 school districts. By 2006, only 13,000 school districts. What has happened? We've had huge centralization of our education system. So we have decisions being made not close to the site of change, but in huge districts where parental voices often get drowned out by other voices. And this centralization tendency uh, has not translated into good outcomes, and there's not great evidence that it works. And so more independent schools, more parental 
voice, more authority in the hands of parents who know best the needs of their students, a wider array of options, a more dynamic system really meets the needs of, edu of our students in a much better way than this centralization tendency that we're um, engaged in right now. And the Common Core has been a great example of that that we hope to maybe we can speak about later. The third uh, issue with respect to chal a challenge with government-run schools is this idea of competition and choice and the idea that we really don't have enough of it, many feel. Uh, we can estimate that um, there are uh, 40,000 students in Colorado alone on wait lists for charter schools. What does that tell you? It tells you that parents want options for their kids. And we know that what works in fifth grade doesn't work in high school. I have a number of nieces and nephews that have moved in and out of the system in various types of, of schools, different genres, service delivery models to meet needs uh, based on where they're at, you know, and, and to have a system that's unitary, homogeneous, and really aiming toward the middle does not meet the needs of our, of our kids. So I think these are some challenges that we need to address. Jeff has suggested uh, some ways that we can think about that, and I'll turn it over now to Derek to uh, talk a little bit about his experience. So thanks again for being here tonight. Great. Thanks a lot. So I would like to say what Jeff said. Um, and and I, I appreciate the uh, introduction of me as an educator, but that's really not my background getting into uh, charter schools and school choice. Uh, my background is actually in military national security. Um, I, was, I got into this as a concerned parent. I've never taken an education class, but I'm fortunate enough to now be leading a network of charter schools here in Colorado. Um, again, I, the, the power of parents is a pretty amazing thing who uh, just want a better outcome for their, or better opportunities for their kids. For me, I, I had the chance to work with some inner city charter schools in Denver Public Schools. Um, these are schools that serve a high minority, high, um, high rates of kids living in poverty. And I remember, and they're grant funded. There's a substantial amount of foundation dollars coming in to support these schools because these are opportunities that these kids need. But I remember walking down the halls one day of, of one of these schools, and on the bulletin board, they had this Monopoly man with his top hat on, dollars floating all over, which is good. Kids need to learn about capitalism. They need to learn about entrepreneurship. They need to learn what it takes to get ahead and make a difference in their own lives. But what was sad is that around that Monopoly man, there was a, a big red circle with an X through it. The irony that we are going to um, denigrate wealth and wealth creation and productivity it just wasn't it seemed to be lost from everybody that this is what these kids need to aspire to. They don't have to be irresponsible with, with wealth, but they need to be given opportunities and recognize them. So um, that's when I first started to notice there, there's a problem here, and, and we're not sending good messages for the children, the most vulnerable children in our populations, and especially the ones that we need to be helping. So that was a, a concern to me when I had kids. Uh, what are the values coming out of public education? And then when my, uh, when my oldest was two at the time, I started looking around at schools and the outcome, and I think uh, Laura and actually Deb can talk about this as well, but if you look at the mission and vision of a lot of uh, schools these days, it's all about college and career readiness. Um, that is the goal, college and career readiness. Um, I want my kids to go out, I want them to live a good life, I want them to have good jobs, I want them to be ready for whatever they want to do. But that is not inspiring to me as a parent why I'm gonna send my kids out for 13 years to be educated by somebody else. If you get into the purposes of education, as Dr. Scheffel mentioned, one of the big things, this goes back to the Greeks and Aristotle and running a network of classical schools. These are the people that we look to frequently. Uh, we need to prepare kids to flourish. They need to have the tools to be able to be happy in life. We also, uh, the, the reason, why do we as a society invest in publicly fund education? Well, part of that is because we also need to transmit a culture. There are things about living in a free society, the ideas of the founders of a country like ours that don't just occur naturally. We have to pass those ideas along. And, and those are really important things to me and my family that public education needs to be doing these things if we're gonna continue living in a country like America. So I had those two things, and it was a, a former congressman who runs another school here in Colorado, Bob Schaefer. Uh, I was going through a program with him, with him at the time, and he framed it pretty succinctly that it is the right and responsibility for parents to direct the upbringing and education of their children. For me, that was a real clear idea of 
what's missing in a large part of public education today, because we've lost that focus. Um, as, as Jeff mentioned with John Dewey, it's the idea that uh, we're not partnering with parents, we're now replacing parents. Again, who's alarmed by that? <laughs> so I, I'm really excited that we run uh, a network of charter schools here that are currently expanding. We have a school in Golden, Golden View Classical Academy. Uh, we opened up one this past year in Douglas County, Ascent Classical Academies of Douglas County. And right now we're working on a third up in uh, the Boulder Valley, Adams 12 area, so up in Northwest part. And, uh, we have plans to build uh, a lot more of them to serve more families, and we've had people who've seen the success of our flagship schools say, this is great, they've come and done tours, and we said, we need more of this. We need schools that respect us as parents. They partner with us as parents, they don't try to replace us. So we're really excited about opportunities to do that. Deb touched on a really important thing. I think when we talk about school choice and the framework to be able to do interesting things uh, with public education. Even people on the conservative side are really tied in this idea of local control. They're okay pushing things down to local school boards and just letting it stay there uh, because that's, that's local control. They're elected. The downside is when you are operating that way, uh, it, it's easy, we've seen this in Colorado, that special interests frequently control a lot of these school boards. And these school boards are the gatekeepers to school choice in Colorado. When Colorado was founded in the Colorado Constitution, a school district was made up of the parents of 10 children. Parents of 10 kids could get together, <laughs> file, say, we want to be a school district. We want to start a school. And that was, that was local control as envisioned in the Constitution of Colorado. This idea um, that we have school districts of tens of thousands of kids and five people now control access to what those parents have is not what was envisioned in, in Colorado. And that idea of local control, it, it slowly evolved to well, maybe parents of 15 kids. And at one time in Colorado, we had 3,000 school districts in the state of Colorado alone. So parents had a voice in the education of their kids. We're now at under 200 school districts. I think it's 180 something now. So conservatives especially need to wake up and reject the idea that school districts are local control. Uh, we need to get back to what it was intended to be. So what, 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 does, what does local control have to do with charter schools and school choice anyway? The frameworks for charter schools in, in Colorado are that local school districts can be the exclusive gatekeepers to the choices that parents have in the community. So they can uh, have exclusive, it's called exclusive chartering authority. They can say, we want to be the only people to say what schools can come into our school district. Um, unfortunately, we had, a, um, we, we had a unfortunate vote this week in Adams County where a school district uh, or a, a board of five people came together and denied an application for a charter school of ours. And as Jeff mentioned, actually five of the top 10 or six of the top 10 most successful schools in the state of Colorado are actually classical or liberal arts schools like ours. So we have a replication school. We have over 560 kids interested in our school. So we have the interest, we have facilities, and we have the proven model. We have five people who say, we don't like what you're offering. We just personally don't like your low tech approach, we don't like your curriculum, uh, whatever the reasons are. Um, that's not okay for me as a parent for somebody else to say what choices my kids are gonna have access to. So um, look forward to a lot of questions and uh, thanks Jeff. Great. All right, Mr. Mike Rosen. All right, well Jeff, I'd like you to, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and what caught Jeff's interest was a column I recently wrote that was in uh, Complete Colorado, which is the website of the Independence Institute. And I was responding to a letter to the editor in the Denver Post. And that letter attacked Krista Kafer. And Krista Kafer has been associated with Colorado Christian University. She's Absolutely. been a lecturer here. And as I noted at the time, uh, she doesn't need me to defend her. Krista is very, very capable. She's brilliant, experienced, uh, right-center. Nobody with any objectivity could call her a radical right-winger. 
But she wrote this column, and I deconstructed the column, excuse me, I, I deconstructed the letter to the editor based on the column that she had, she had written. Now, I've been following the idea, the concept of school choice for 50 years when I first learned about it from Milton Friedman, who was a big advocate for it and generously funded an institute to advance choice vouchers competition in education. Now, it's been a long time since I was in grade school, so long that history wasn't a subject yet. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I remember my geography teacher had a flat globe. <laughs> the Dead Sea back then was only sick. <laughs> if you wanted a glass of water, you had to smash a hydrogen and an oxygen atom together. <laughs> Mozart, by the way, played our school prom. <laughs> but I, I digress. Let me get back to the matter at hand. Uh, so what Krista had written about principally was an optimistic column about the future of educational choice in Colorado with the election of Jared Polis. And she cited the fact that Jared has been a supporter and a financier of charter schools. He was associated with Polly Baca. Incidentally, a former state legislator, you might remember when she was Polly Baca Berrigan, but uh, she created something called the New American School, and uh, Jared had financed that. He also created a transition team in the early period of his governorship, and in spite of the fact that there's someone there from the Colorado Education Association and uh, uh, another... Uh, a Democratic member of the Colorado State Board of Education. Uh, there were some other people on that transition team, like Mike Johnston, who didn't get the Democratic nomination for governor, but he supported charters. Uh, Bob Schaefer, former state representative, and of course the headmaster of the uh, Liberty Common Charter School. Uh, and even, and I wasn't familiar with Jan Walmer, but I've learned about her. Uh, she was the director of the Colorado State uh, uh, Branch of Democrats for Education Reform. Hmm. Well, when she showed up at the Colorado Democratic State Assembly, she's a supporter of charter schools, by the way, she was roundly booed by the delegates who then voted to remove the name Democrat from her organization. You might also remember Joe Lieberman former senator from Connecticut who was selected to be a vice presidential running mate, except Joe Lieberman, although he had a very liberal voting record in Connecticut, a very liberal state, uh, committed the sin of supporting charters and vouchers. And he was literally written out of the Democratic Party. He dropped his Democratic Party registration. So uh, Krista was hopeful that maybe Jared Polis would advance choice and competition. She did note that he had voted against voucher programs when he was in Congress. But then again, Jared has always been ambitious. He was planning to run for United States Senator, and the last thing he wanted was the Joe Lieberman treatment. So while he was in Congress, he certainly couldn't support vouchers. Uh, the teacher unions, the most powerful unions in the United States of America today, much more powerful than the Teamsters or the United Auto Workers, uh, will not allow any Democrat to support vouchers, and that's, that applies to the state legislature as well. Uh, so uh, let me be specific and take on some of the, the assertions and charges that this letter writer made, which is a, a wonderful springboard to making some of the points that I wanted to make here today that I'm sure will come up in the Q&A session. Uh, you know, the, the Post gave Krista a, a weekly column last year where she is very much a token conservative at the very liberal, very Democrat, very anti-Trump Denver Post. Uh, the claim of the letter writer, one of them was, vouchers to private schools will simply siphon off money from public schools so that the more affluent, well-off families can get an unneeded discount. My response to which is, not so. Public funding of education from local property taxes or general state tax revenues is fundamentally intended to finance the individual education of school children in the most effective manner. 
And it shouldn't matter whether that takes, in a, takes place in a public or a private school, or a secular school or a religious school. That concept, by the way, has been upheld by the United States Supreme Court in a decision that it handed down, 5-4 of course, regarding the legality of religious schools with voucher funding in not only Cleveland but in Milwaukee, which had happened before that. Uh, so that is established law right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the First Amendment to the Constitution is not anti-religious when it says Congress shall, shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the opposite. It was designed to protect religious diversity because the founders remembered the Anglican Church, the official state church of England, and they didn't want an official church in this country at the expense of other religions and dom denominations. They wanted religious diversity, and I'm glad that the Supremes uh, have established that, although keep in mind if the court majority at the time had been five liberals and four Democrats, that would not have been the verdict that the Supreme Court handed down. A voucher is, educated, is, is issued to the parents of school-age children, who can then redeem that voucher to pay for some or all of a child's tuition at a private school of the parent's choice. Military veterans, like me, for example, help finance their college education under the GI Bill in a very similar way. A voucher system wouldn't alter the current policy of compulsory education or public funding of schools. It would just create more choices in the delivery of that publicly funded education. To assert, as this letter writer did, that money is siphoned off from public schools when parents choose a private school with their voucher presupposes that public schools are always the better choice. And it also reveals a fundamental bias that having government provide a service is always preferable to the private sector. Thank goodness the rest of our economy doesn't work that way. <laughs> Many Americans, for example, prefer FedEx or UPS to the U.S. Postal Service. Why should education be any different? Harvard, Yale, Princeton, or conservative Hillsdale College in Michigan <laughs> aren't government schools, yet seem to be well attended and highly regarded, and they productively coexist with government schools. Think of the University of Denver in Colorado and the University of Colorado, a public school, CSU, a public school, UNC, a public school. Colorado College is a private school. They coexist. If large numbers of parents were to use vouchers for private schools, public schools with fewer students wouldn't need as many teachers and administrators or as much money. The money wouldn't be siphoned off, as the letter writer asserted. It would simply be redirected more efficiently and responsibly to private schools by parents who are the customers of publicly funded education, the decision makers. The kids can't make that decision. They're not competent to do so at an early age. Vouchers empower families that otherwise might not be able to afford a private school with the purchasing power to do so, creating more demand for private schools. Now in our market economy, that would lead to an increase in the supply of private schools, breeding more competition in the educational marketplace and public schools would have to meet that test of competition. Greater competition is a proven pathway to more choices and better services in any endeavor. Ironically, it would force improvement in the public schools. Everyone wins except the teacher unions who hate competition. They enjoy their monopoly on the delivery of education with public funds. By the way, teacher unions also hate, as do any other unions, competition among the rank and file members. That's why teacher unions don't ever want merit pay or performance pay. They want collective compensation based on years of seniority and postgraduate degree credentials. This is not the way the rest of our society operates. The kind of performance pressure applied to people in the private sector produces better results. When the subject of, of school funding comes up, and of course, uh, schools aren't manufacturing plants, 
they're part of the service sector. Uh, there's no inventory. There's no machinery per se other than utilities and infrastructure. 85% of school spending is in form of payroll, as you would expect. The best way to improve performance is to be able to reward the best teachers and not award teachers simply on the basis of longevity. As for well-off families getting, as this letter writer put it, an unneeded discount, Rich families can already afford private schools. Those who send their kids there pay higher taxes to subsidize public schools that they don't use. And by the way, they pay higher taxes because they make more money. That means they pay more in income taxes. And the state equalization formula tries to equalize spending in the schools by diverting general revenues to rural schools that don't have the same property tax base. Also, of course, property taxes are the major, major funder of, of public schools. And rich people have much more expensive property that they own, hence they pay a much greater share of the property tax burden and don't use those public schools that they're paying for if they're paying for private schools right now. In any event, if politically necessary to appease the resentment and covetousness of Bernie Sanders' progressives, a voucher system could include a means test to deny vouchers to their de despised 1%. <laughs> and who's to say a voucher that acts as a private school discount is unneeded or undeserved by the much greater numbers of middle-income families who would qualify? They, too, would continue to subsidize public schools with their tax dollars, even when they choose a private school option for their kids, because they wouldn't be using the public schools anymore. And most of the nation's voucher systems that already exist are in lower income families, with long waiting lists of minority families desperate to escape failing public schools. You're probably familiar with Harlem Prep, which uh, has grade schools now, middle schools, and high schools. Uh, that's in New York City. Also, uh, Stanley Drunken Miller, you know that name? Uh, he's a billionaire, very successful in our private enterprise economy. He has given tens of millions of dollars to Jeffrey Canada's uh, New York City Success Academy Charter Schools. There's a whole series of them. And this, again, is in very poor neighborhoods in New York City. Another important consideration is a political one. Many parents oppose the ideology and agenda of the progressive public school establishment. Jeff, you referred to this. K through 12 public education is dominated by a progressive culture that covets its monopoly power to influence and indoctrinate impressionable young minds in its dogma. Curricula and textbooks obsess on the flaws and imperfections of American history and downplay our virtues and our achievements. They call this critical thinking. <laughs> also fashionable in educratic circles is an emphasis on what's known as affective education, if you've heard that term, as opposed to cognitive education. Affective education, and this concept comes out of the teachers' colleges, is all about how the kids feel as opposed to cognitive education, which is what the kids come to know. So feelings overpower reason. It fits perfectly into the progressive mold. Self-esteem trumps actual achievement. Multiculturalism encourages identity politics and discourages assimilation. This concentration on social engineering crowds out basic academics. It's no surprise a majority of millennial graduates prefer socialism to capitalism and social justice to meritocracy. For parents who prefer an educational philosophy more in line with their own values and beliefs, expanded school choice and vouchers can be a salvation. Uh, finally, Krista Kafer's critic concluded with this passage in his letter to the editor. I contend that our focus, he said, should be on making every public school in our state a center of excellence, striving to give every child an equal chance. Really? 
This is a prayer masquerading as a policy. It's a meaningless, turgid platitude. It's an idealistic plea pretending to be a remedy, and he offered nothing in the way of specific proposals to get to that utopian goal other than throwing more taxpayer money and denying choice at the same publicly contaminated and underperforming system. So that was my rebuttal to his letter to the editor, and that's all I have to say. Right. <laughs> Ms. Boggs. Thank you, Jeff. I'm humbled to be able to sit here this evening and to have this conversation with you all. And I have no idea how I got here, <laughs> these brilliant <laughs> folks up here, other than I am a mom. Um, and about a decade ago, discovered that public education was actually governed by moms and dads. Um, I want to thank CCU, the Centennial Institute, and Jeff for having this conversation tonight. And I want to thank you all for being here to have this very important conversation. Uh, many of you know that I am the daughter of a public school teacher. My mom taught in inner city Cincinnati for most of her 30 years. And so from a very tiny age, I learned a couple of things about public education. Um, first and foremost, it was ingrained to me, as Dr. Shuffle said, that if we don't have a publicly funded um, education system that provides equitable education, we don't have a republic. I make this um, correction to folks, including adults, all the time. We do not live in a democracy. We live in a republic. And the reason that that's incredible, thank you very much. <laughs> and the reason that's incredibly important to me is because people need to be able to read their ballots and do their homework and know how to vote. Because we don't all get together in the town square and figure out who has the most little votes. We all vote on who represents us. Jeff mentioned House Bill 1032. I hope we come back to that later on in this discussion because things pass through the Golden Dome and we need to know about what they're doing. So I am the daughter of a public school teacher and I do believe that publicly funded and publicly run education is critical when successful to continuing our republic. Um, how many of you all went to public schools? All right, good. How many of you send your children or grandchildren to public schools? Okay, now that's a smaller number. That's interesting. Um, I think we need to start this discussion. Oh, let me ask where we're from. How many of you all are from Jeffco? How many of you live in Jeffco? Okay, Adams, Douglas County, Denver, somewhere else? Arapaho. Okay, good. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Good job. I feel like I'm at the Western Conservative Summit. Where are we from? <laughs> if you haven't gotten your tickets to that, do that. Sorry. Um, I think we need to start with a conversation about what is the purpose of public education. And you know, it's interesting to me that you can find bright people to have discussions about this. For me, and I think Dr. Shuffle said this well, it's to create a common culture. One of the things that I think is most interesting, if you've had an opportunity to travel in Canada, Canada is also a country of immigrants, and they do not espouse to the melting pot theory that we have in the United States. So one of the things about public education for me is creating that common culture, and I do think that that has something to do with the values that we hold, but I think in the environment that we live in today, it's very important that we are cautious about expecting our publicly run schools, both run by parents and not, to be the conveyors of the values. For me, that's a parent's role. And when parents are in charge of that public education, it works well. When they're not, we get this story that I was um, told a couple of weeks ago. Um, an opportunity to talk to a mom who told me about her 16-year-old coming home one day from school who said to her, Mom, life begins when a child is born. Now this is a Catholic mom, and you might imagine, being here in this Christian university, that that did not sit well with that Catholic mom. But that was a 16-year-old. And so as Jeff asked me to think about what are some of the challenges of our publicly run schools in the state of Colorado, I think the first is that we don't really know how bad it is for a very long time. Right, whether it's your 16-year-old who comes home with morals that you did not instill in them, 
or it's your 16 or 17 year old taking an ACT or an SAT to go off to college. I think for many of us, if our children are in public schools, we face what my mother, the English teacher, her $5 word, cognitive dissidence, right? We drive our children or our grandchildren to school or we support our children who send our grandchildren to public school. And it's impossible to believe that we do that and that we send them to something that's less than excellent, right? Does anybody in this room want something less than excellent for your children or your grandchildren? Anybody? Okay, so if we want the very, very best for our children and our grandchildren, to understand that 50% of our third graders don't read at grade level. Now we can fight all day about whether the tests are measuring what we want them to do, but I want you to quickly look at your neighbor and figure out which one of the two of you, if you were in third grade, won't read. I'm not kidding. Which one of the two of you? And if both of you, as third graders, read proficiently, think about other audiences. If all of you are the third graders in a school and you're all reading at grade level and yet in Colorado, one in two do not, think of other audiences where that means every single person in that audience didn't read well as a third grader. Why is that important? Because if you get to fourth grade and you're not reading at grade level, you cannot assimilate the material. And if you don't have an excellent, and I mean excellent teacher, you're not going to get caught up. Now I want you to think about your favorite seven-year-old six-year-old, those are third graders. And by that time, in our publicly run education, we have put those children on a path. I don't care how much we believe or not believe that we're not Germany and we don't track kids. The reality is if you're coming out of third grade and you don't read proficiently, what are your future success possibilities? So for me, the challenges are number one, we don't know how bad it is. And even when we know how bad it is, sometimes we're not willing to admit that to ourselves. Secondly, we don't know who's in charge. All right, Dr. Scheffel talked a lot about the bureaucracy. In our public education system in Colorado, I think Derek mentioned 200 schools, I think it's around that, 178 different school systems, 179, if you count the Charter School Institute. Um, who runs those? Because the honest truth is, everyday people I want you to look at that person that you came with again. One of the two of you could be on a school board. Whether that's a charter school or a school district, one of the two of you could be on a charter school board or on a school board because they are run by folks just like you and I. So do we know who's in charge? And then finally, do we know what to do about this? If you're passionate, and I assume you are, or you wouldn't be here on a Monday night, if you're passionate about this, what do you do about it? You know, my grandmother used to say all the time when I would say to her, Grandma, I just don't know what to do. She would say, Laura Beth, because of course grandmas always call you by two names, right? <laughs> Laura Beth, you can't eat an elephant unless you start with one bite. So I will say to you all, you can't eat this elephant unless you start with one bite. Whatever you are called to do, that is what you must do. But you must walk out of here this evening with a commitment to do something to help us improve the equitable access of public education in the state of Colorado, because if we don't, we will pay for it one way or another. Thank you, Laura. So be thinking of your questions. We're going to get to audience questions here in just a second. I uh, want to be very timely, make sure you get out of here on time. But I'm going to start with just a few questions. Um, Dean Scheffel, uh, one of the challenges we face in Colorado is the uh, need to get teachers out to rural communities. Uh, CCU received a grant uh, to be able to help with that. But what are your solutions? You sit on the State Board of Education. What are you all working towards to get uh, teachers out to those rural communities? Uh, there are some good programs where uh, higher education partners with school districts to uh, create incentives for teachers to move into rural districts. There are some real issues, uh, particularly in shortage areas like special education, science, math, for rural districts to be able to hire well-prepared teachers and to keep them. This, the the, the um, retention issue is a big issue too. 
it's great when teachers can stay several years and get a sense of the district and the culture and really be successful with students. So I think some of those partnerships between higher education and districts in rural areas can be really effective for um, incentivizing teachers to um, teach in rural areas. Uh, Derek, question for you. I heard this at the uh, Douglas County School Board meeting one time. Um, charters draw out students from neighborhood schools and engage parents. And in many ways, you end up losing some of the most engaged parents uh, because they want a particular type of curriculum or values shared with their children, so they choose charter schools. So that leaves these neighborhood schools to be empty, to have uh, the more active parents are now moved out, and so the system starts to unravel itself. Um, how do you respond to that criticism of charter schools? That's a good question. <laughs> I, uh, and I, I think you touched on this a little bit yourself, and we've heard a little bit uh, from Dr. Sheffel as well. So if you look across the state, there are waiting lists on charter schools. Parents want more options. They want more choice for their kids. And again, that's not always an indictment that the school district or the government-run schools are bad. It's just that parents want more choices. I know as an example, our schools, we offer direct instruction. We have kids sitting in rows and desks, teachers in front of the room. Kids sit, they wear uniforms. It's, it's a very formal, traditional school environment. Um, that's contrasted to a lot of classrooms you'll see today where kids sit in groups with pods and the teacher floats around the room and kids are expected to learn from each other and somehow to spontaneously become educated. Um, simplification. But our parents want different options. And I think when we hear school boards step in and say they know what's best for families. Families don't really know what's best for their kids. Let, let us be the ones to tell you. Um, it's really disappointing. We hear we don't need more charters. We need because they're pulling the best kids out. So let's shut down the competition. It's rare that you hear enough self-awareness and introspection where a school district will say, okay, parents are leaving. When offered more choice, parents want something else. How can we respond to that and offer what parents want? How can we do a better job in our schools? That's not the conversation that typically takes place. Instead, it's, uh, as, as Mike said, shut down your competition, which is why I'm a huge proponent of we need to change the framework to disempower um, school boards to allow more competition for charter schools to be able to partner with good partners. Great. Uh, Mike. Jeff, before, yeah, go ahead. before you put a question to me, can I just pile on sure. with an answer to that question? You remember when the Berlin Wall came down? A lot of people left East Germany for someplace else. <laughs> they didn't go the other way. <laughs> Sears, which was a giant in retailing for 100 years, Sears is about to go bankrupt because the customers didn't want it anymore. Right. There will nonetheless take Boulder, Boulder Valley School District. Boulder is a very left-wing progressive place. The parents who might want to take their kids out of that progressive environment so that rather than have their kids conditioned to become social justice warriors, uh, perhaps they'd rather send them to a place where they'd learn something about economics and capitalism and become entrepreneurs. But there will always be a huge demand in this blue state, we're not red anymore, for schools that teach progressive values, so they're not going to disappear. Some parents just want to be able to escape that and go to something else. One size doesn't fit all. You wanted to ask me something. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm going to pivot just a second. I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate mm -hmm. here. So we talk about, you know, different schools. We want to have cons maybe conservative, classical, trained schools. We want to have progressive schools. Mm -hmm. But Laura brought up the point that we need to have a common culture. So how do you still develop a common American culture when you have schools that provide very different values? That's a great question. And Laura talked about the melting pot where people would come from other countries and assimilate. The parents got here and couldn't speak English, but the second generation could speak English. Mm -hmm. And they assimilated to learn and embrace and admire American values. That's why people are leaving Mexico to come to the United States. And isn't it ironic? Some of those people who couldn't get out of Mexico fast enough, not all of them, 
but the more radical elements, now they wave Mexican fans and anti flags at anti-American demonstrations. That always puzzles me. Uh, a common culture, I think it's unachievable right now because of the great public divide, what Jonah Goldberg calls tribalism, factionalism, identity politics. Mm -hmm. And to have a common educational approach in this day and age, given the politics of this state, for example, it would be on the progressive's terms. That's why they don't want to let us escape and go to schools where the kids will have their parents' values endorsed and reinforced as opposed to challenged and disrespected. Mm. So uh, your question implies that we can have a common culture, one that those of us in this room would prefer. We can't because the other side controls public education and controls higher education as well and controls Hollywood and television and social media. Laura, do you want to answer that same question? Well, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic. <laughs> so I wish Krista were here. <laughs> um, while I don't disagree, I, I do have um, lots of room in my head and heart for optimism because, um, because you're all here. If, if we had come tonight and there were five people in this audience and there were four of us on the stage, I might be a little bit more pessimistic. But um, there are only a couple secrets you need to know. Secret number one, go be on a school accountability committee. Jeff mentioned PTA, fine, lovely organization. But do you know where curriculum decisions are made? It's on the accountability committee. Do you know we have a state law in Colorado that says there needs to be somebody on the accountability committee who's not connected to the school? Raise your hand if you don't currently have a kiddo in a public school. You all, right there, hands up, go get on an accountability committee. <laughs> she just volunteered you all. Fine, thank you. <laughs> Find your closest school. So I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic because parent-run schools can be government-run district schools if you all are on the accountability committees, if you all are running for school boards, if you all are voting for school board members that you want to run these government-run schools. We know it can work, we know it's an uphill battle, but I am more optimistic than my friend, Mr. Rosen, because you all are here, and I trust that you're gonna walk out of here tonight doing something about this. Right. Mm -hmm. Deb? Just to follow up on that, I would say teaching the truths of our history to the next generation from original sources goes a long way to helping us get on the same page as far as our values of freedom and virtue, and I would say that parents and the, our society needs to demand that. I would also say that there's a recent research article that was encouraging in that uh, using distance, number of competitors, and types of options in terms of schools, those three variables and how close they are to a traditional public school results in increased achievement in all the schools, including the traditional public schools. So I think that just the specter of competition and options causes schools to be more responsive to the public and what it wants. And one of those central things needs to be that our students are taught the truths of our history from original sources so that we can understand our past and how we got to where we are. Great. Great. All right, at this point, we're going to turn it over to questions. Now, it's important that you don't start your question until you've been handed a microphone from either Ethan or Mira. Um, because we have people watching online and they won't be able to hear you. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, we'll start with this gentleman in the blue right there. Amira's going to give you the microphone. Thank you very much. And I, uh, I'm a public school teacher and a homeschool dad, so I have a very a uh, unique look at uh, education. And this is my uh, 21st year in the classroom. So Dr. Shuffle, I would love a job from you someday. And Di Eric, I would love you from a job from you someday <laughs> uh, to get out of the public schools and do something different. Um, and I agree with everything that's been said. Public school, it's a, it's a tough place uh, to teach. It's a tough place for, for our students. Um, but I wanted to echo what Mrs. Boggs said is that um, the enemy is not the public school. The enemy is still the enemy. And I think that we need to 
to pray for our public schools, and I think we need to remember our public schools because uh, our children, our grandchildren are gonna come alongside these peers and they're gonna work with them and they're gonna interact with them and they're gonna marry them, okay? And so we need, them, we need to still pray for our public schools and we still need to remember them. We need to come alongside our public school teachers and encourage them because um, there are conservative teachers in the public schools. I'm one and we, uh, we uh, there's another one. Yeah, there's, there, there, there's, <laughs> there's, there's several, right? Uh, so, so that, that would be my encouragement is just to, like Mrs. Boggs said, is to get involved and to, to, to come alongside the public school. You've listed a lot of great things about things that are ills and things that are wrong with public schools. So I guess my fear is, as a public school or as a homeschool dad is, if we are in asking for and wanting government funding to come into parochial schools and vouchers, aren't we also asking for the government to, isn't it an inroad for the government? And if we turn our, our parochial schools to the government and our homeschool to the government, aren't we just inviting these same kind of ills into our homes, into our school, or private, private schools? Mike, you wanna take that? Yeah. Uh, if we did have a voucher system, no school would be required to take those dollars. And if a given school didn't like the terms that government was imposing, then that school would say, I'm sorry, we're not gonna take your money or don't apologize for it. Uh, we're gonna maintain what we've been doing and uh, still offer that, that alternative. How many people here voted for uh, Jared Polis for governor? <laughs> no. Okay, that's all right. Uh, the rest of you in this state are now in the minority. How many here wanted a Democrat majority in both houses of the state legislature? We're in the minority. Uh, Laura, when you and your conservative school board at Jeffco had those two wonderful years of Camelot, <laughs> and then the teachers Wasn't union. Wasn't all that Camelot. <laughs> not, not only the local teachers union, but the uh, National Education Association gathered together an army to come in and defeat you in the next election, and they won. What I'm saying is, I'm not gonna predict the future 10 and 20 years from now, but right now, we're in the minority, and we're gonna be educated on the terms of the majority. And as you said, we're a republic that respects the rights and independence and individuality of the minority. And the only way we're gonna get that, something like what we want in education, is by going outside of the system that is run by a majority that fundamentally disagrees with us and calls us deplorables. Mm -hmm. right. Charters and vouchers, and vouchers even better than charters, I love charters too, but charters are still part of the political structure of a school district. The vouchers are independent of that. Now we've got some great charter schools here in spite of that. Mm -hmm. And this question about taking government money, you're taking government money in your charter school, but you maintain your independence, haven't you? So I. I while I'm not as optimistic as Laura, I'm not paranoid either. And this one argument about, no, let's not have vouchers because they might be controlled by government, I'll take my chances on that. <laughs> so I want to jump in real quick if you don't mind. Sure. Just two quick points. Yeah, one is Canada has had vouchers for, I think, two centuries. And while certainly it is true that government tests and makes sure that when you take public money that there's some level of quality happening there. I think that we need to look to our neighbors to the north for what that might look like and how the government's involved. Second, thank you for your service. Um, and I was reading Daniel this morning. I think we're common cultured enough in this room that you all know what that means. I was reading Daniel this morning and we do need to pray for public education. We still, in the United States of America, have the freedom to pray openly and always and Daniel reminded me of the power of our God and the miracles that can happen every single day and that also gives me hope and optimism. Thank you for your service. Right. Anil, back there. This will be a good question. <laughs> um, after the election, uh, the Denver Teachers Union filed a CORA an open records request, and got the names of addresses of all the charter school teachers and addresses. My wife went to public school in New York City. 
I went to public school in Philadelphia. Um, they've tried charter schools and they've been brutalized by the teachers union. It seems like here in Colorado, we don't want to fight. We got brutalized in Jefferson County with an awesome conservative board. We got brutalized in Denver, I mean, uh, Douglas County. What will it take people, good people, to rise up and stand up and fight? Because right now, we have to understand our opponents are on a war path. And until, what will it take good people to stand up? Because um, I'm the chairman of the Adams County Republican Party. And across the state, about 300,000 Republicans did not even vote. And this education is extremely important. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking the panel, what will it take people to stand up because the apathy is killing us? Question. Can I take that one? Well, I, I, I guess, Anil, again, I'm a little bit more optimistic. Um, I, I guess I, I don't really see them as enemies. I mean, my neighbor doesn't want bad things for their children either. Um, sometimes they're misguided. Sometimes they're lied to. Um, but I think that I still believe that God has a purpose for that. And um, sometimes we forget that there are 6,000 new parents or whatever the number is in your district every year. Um, kindergarten parents who come in who don't know what happened last year or the year before or five years before that. Um, so I'm optimistic that some folks in here will decide to run for school boards and some folks in here will support other folks who are running for school boards. Um, I, don't see, I don't see the same lack of excitement around education. I don't, again, I go back to I don't think people know what to do. And, and I hope you all walk out of here tonight and commit to telling three of your neighbors that you're going to run for school board or that they're going to run for school board. Um, because I think you just have to do something. So I'm not quite as pessimistic. Part of the question, part of the challenge that Neil was pointing out was um, you've run for school board, you've been on school board, you've run for school board. Um, they're not very nice to you when you run for school board. I mean, they're, they're very intense and they'll rip, you know, they'll f dig into your past, they'll find anything they can to stop you. And so it's one thing to get involved, but you also have to have the perseverance to fight and to recognize that you're fighting for a, a good and that they're going to do their best to stop you in every capacity, but you've got to persevere. And um, both of you all have been in that limelight. And we saw some of our friends, John Newkirk, and the rest of the school board here in J Douglas County just ripped to shreds during the last shred, during yeah. the last campaign. So, I mean, it is a battle. It's, it really is out there. So I appreciate that, Jeff. And to be honest, I had no idea. I mean, really, if, you, if we had been sitting here in 2009, in January of 2009, I'd been sitting in the audience, I would have been a a mom, just like you guys, thinking that when over the summer my husband and I were fighting about who was going to do run for the school board and we kept pointing at each other, that it really was going to be like a super PTA, that my friend Kelly and I would still get along and that we wouldn't tell lies about each other and that, you know, things were going to be just like PTAs were and that's not what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but what I quickly discovered to our, my friend who's a teacher, um, for me anyway, I hit my knees very early in that process. And um, some great politician said, if you're not taking flack, you're not over the target. <laughs> and I hit my knees and God made it not feel like it was hard. He just made it feel like I was called to do it. It doesn't mean it was always fun with rooms filled with people like this who weren't very excited about the fact that I got to influence that. But I, I have to tell you, if we don't, we risk our republic. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to let us be in a position where folks, 50% of our third graders don't read at grade level? That doesn't get fixed without f two more years of excellent teachers who we aren't paying with respect enough to come out of college and go into Public education, I have two very lovely, I think they're amazing because they're my children. And one of them is a PhD candidate at Michigan. He would not be a teacher for $34,000 a year. One of them's a business major at DU. She would not be a teacher for $34,000 a year. Do they make a lot of money over time and in including para? Yes, I don't disagree with the average teacher salary, all compensation. But we're not paying them enough coming out of college to attract and retain our best and brightest. That has got to change. It's more complicated than that. And 
and I understand your good intentions. <laughs> but Leon Trotsky once said, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. Right. Analogous to that, you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. And school policy in this state and in this country is all about politics. Milton Friedman talked about the concentrated versus the diffused interest. I bet a number of you are familiar with that concept. Laura is a victim of the concentrated interest, and the concentrated interest was the teachers' union. The, the victory for one bright shining hour or two years in Jeffco was an existential threat to teacher unions all over the country. And that's why the National Education Association mobilized to drive the demons out of the Jefferson County School Board. And they did. Uh, they've got the money, they've got the organization, and all of us in this room are individuals. Now, sure, I, I've been fighting all my life for this kind of stuff, and I do it in a different venue. I do it in the media. I may be in the media, but I'm not of the media. Media is also dominated by, by liberals. Uh, the, the deck is stacked against us. That's okay. It's always been stacked against us, and I've never given up. But let's not delude ourselves about the power of the enemy. And they are the enemy. That teacher's union hates competition. They want to protect their monopoly just like any institution that benefits from monop monopoly wants to do. Uh, it's no surprise that a majority of millennials think socialism is better than capitalism. This is the immense value of controlling public education, brainwashing the next generation. And they've been successful in the interim before some tidal wave changes the majority in Colorado from, from blue to red. In the meantime, the best avenue we have is getting out of that monopoly's control with school choice, doing everything we can to promote school choice. And from a, a partisan standpoint, Republicans need to capitalize on that because blacks and Hispanics are much more supportive of school choice than whites are. Let's deliver that message to them. Great, great. Um, we're going to ask one more question. And then um, I want you all to be thinking the most important public policy priority to improve government-run education. It doesn't have to be a public policy itself. It could be more parental involvement and getting involved. But I want you to be thinking about that. And then we'll go down the line and get that so everyone has at least one thing to take away from each one of you. We'll do one more question here. The lady over here. Hold on, real quick. They gotta get you the microphone. Uh, actually, it's a teacher talking. <laughs> Hold on, both. They can't hear you all the way. In. So, hi, my name is Sue Johnson, and it's good to see Anil here. I'm the only Republican in Boulder Valley School District, so <laughs> 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 not really, but you know, very few. And um, I'm, I'm actually. Um, my students know me as the House District 6 captain for Republicans in Denver, so that's okay. Um, what I guess that my question is, I accidentally started teaching after 9-11. I'm a software engineer. I have a master's in math, computer science, and all that jazz. And so, I, you know, I, I wanted to teach math until Common Core came along, and this is complete nonsense. But I, I, have, I built a real big computer science program there. And so what, what I think... What I see is this. I'm literally the only conservative. And I, I know what you're saying. I do. And, and right now we're fighting mindfulness training, which is not religious, but it's Buddhist and Hindu, um, and on and on. Um, I just got a flyer tonight for culturally responsive teaching, whatever that means. So, you know, it's, it's a – and these are just fads. So I think that what you're talking about – and. I know I've talked to Laura quite a bit uh, when she was running her campaigns. You know, these are just fads, but the real, what Mike Rosen says, it's the teacher union. And so I guess that what I've been conflicted about, do we just give up and leave the school system? You know, I really respect people that stay in it. It's so hard. I'm the only conservative in that school. And I've been, you know, threatened with, I'm, are you racist? I'm like, what? You know, I mean, just kind of crazy stuff. And so it's, you know, it's, it's definitely, as a conservative, are we supposed to leave and go find 
another school, you know, to teach in. It, it's a hard, it's a conundrum. So that's that's what I would like some comments on. Yeah. And Deb, I think you would be really poised to answer this. You not only serve on the State Board of Education, but you're charged here at CCU to produce the next generation of teachers. And you're not just sending them into private schools or parochial schools, you're equipping them to become great public school teachers. And that, that's an important aspect of this too. It's not just their faith and their values. They have to be competent and really quality teachers. So can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, most of our students actually that graduate in teacher preparation here at CCU go into public, traditional public schools. And I appreciate that because we need Christian teachers in the public education system to be an influence. And I, I ask them to go in with competence, with commitment and passion, and with love for children and with great respect for parents and families. And so I think that we can have a huge influence on the culture just by sending well-prepared godly teachers into the classroom. And that's what we're asked to do as citizens of the kingdom to impact our culture for Christ. And so we want our teachers to be in whatever at whatever venue they want to be in, but many of them just go in most to just traditional uh, public schools. Right. And they so make a big difference. So stay present. Stay engaged. Stay engaged. And, and I, I always think of it in terms of macro, micro. When we look at the system on a macro level, there are many impediments, as this teacher referenced many tides of difficulty that make it hard for just great teachers to do great work every day, though most of them do anyway. But the system itself often does not support teachers the way it needs to. On a micro level, you go into many classrooms, I would say most, and you'll find great teachers doing wonderful work with your kids and grandkids. And that's the micro piece, and that's what our students, we want them to do. Go into classrooms, be competent, teach great skills and knowledge, link it to, to ultimate significance in life, and, and prepare the next generation to be great citizens of this nation. Our teachers are doing that, and, and our, our classrooms in Colorado, Colorado are filled with teachers like that. The system itself is, is problematic for some of the, the values and the quality that we seek. Right. Derek? I think, I think that's a great question. And again, back to, back to my story, how I got involved in this is uh, being a military veteran and somebody who's patriotic. I, I love our country. I like, um, I love the background of our country and the philosophy of which we're built. Um, my concern was I wasn't seeing a focus and appreciation for that. And the great thing about school choice and charter schools in Colorado is if parents have a good idea, if they want something different for their kids, we have a legal framework in the state where we can go out, put an idea together, and go build a school that does it. I think that's great. Um, again, my school, I was very selfish. I wanted one school for my kids because I wanted them to get an education. I wanted them to be able to think. Um, I hate to say critically because I don't know any, any, other, any other way of what you, how you think. It's all critical thinking. Um, but I want them to be able to reason. I want them to just be raised and have a love and appreciation for the cultural heritage that we are a part of here in our country. Um, I was kind of one and done. But you know, the, the hearing from other parents that as we quickly had wait lists, well, how about my kid? And then started looking around, well, my kid's going to graduate. He's going to go and he's going to have peers who didn't have this type of education, as, as I believe as you mentioned. Um, What's the tipping point here? How do we start having an influence? And my kids need to be able to go out in the world and have other kids who've had the experience that my kids have had. So for me, that's how I've been involved in creating more schools, like, like our classical schools, because more kids need this opportunity. They need, they need this appreciation for us to continue as a free country. Um, so my, my answer is get together and support an option. If you don't like what's going on in public education, do better. Get on board with something better. Great. All right. Uh, we're going to go down. We'll start with Ms. Boggs. Uh, one thing that we can do to improve government-run education. Know better. Learn what's actually happening. If you know, you'll share, and you'll do. So get involved. Know better. Great. Mr. Rosen. I think we need to help people understand that there's a distinction between individual teachers and their union. I came up with an acronym, and uh, let me apologize for what the ac acronym sounds like before I, <laughs> and I've said it on the air and written it in, 
in, a, in columns. I call it cat piss. That's C-A-T-P-S. How else would you pronounce it? <laughs> and it, it stands for Chronic Adult Teacher Pet Syndrome. An example of which is your next door neighbor, who's a very lovely 23-year-old woman, graduated from a teacher's college. Uh, you just love her, but you don't understand, you do, a lot of people don't understand that her union has a different agenda than she does and than you do. Uh, I've talked to so many parents who've gotten involved by uh, being a member of the parent-teacher organization or the PTA, whatever the, the, uh, abbreviation they're using, who have gotten frustrated because those bodies are dominated by the cat piss types who don't want to rock the boat. Uh, they want to enlist these people in uh, uh, bakery drives and things like that and have them show up and, and support this, the status quo, but they're not going to take on the culture. Uh, I love so many individual teachers, but I don't love their union and its agenda, which extends well beyond school policy. It's into foreign policy, and they're against defense spending, and on and on and on. At their national convention, the NEA uh, passes... Uh, referenda on all these kinds of things that have nothing to do with public education. Uh, so, the accountability committees you mentioned, they're dominated by the same crowd. And you've seen the same thing with your academy, right? The accountability committee is even worse than the school board on, on opposing your charter. Well, accountabilities are associated with the school, so we actually have a good one that's aligned with our mission. Lucky you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he means the district right. DACs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Derek? So I, I have a laundry list of specific big policy things that need to take place in the legislature. But the question is, how do, how do parents, how do people in this room get involved? So uh, again, it, um, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Um, I think it's getting involved in supporting school choice. I think being involved in your government-run schools is important as well. But I think if people get engaged, help build and establish choices that um, are, are schools that are going to develop children who have the appreciation and uh, virtue that you believe need to be um, present to move society forward or move us forward or preserve what we have here. Be involved. Make that happen. I think once we get schools established uh, that are great schools, not just any schools, I think that's how we have a long-term effect. Um, I appreciate school boards. I think that's just a battle every two years and you're gaining and losing ground, but I think there is a permanence in being able to be involved in expanding school choice. Right, Dean Sheffel. Yeah, my uh, thought would be it's just essential that if you're a parent or you know parents, that people remain engaged in what their kids are learning in school. Kids learn how to think about life and make decisions in school, they're very formative years. And so we need to know what our kids are reading, how they're learning to puzzle through issues. We need to be engaged as the adults to try to help figure out if that's consistent with our values or not. And we need to encourage folks to take advantage of the choices that are available in Colorado. The biggest problem I see is when parents don't like what's happening, but they're not engaged enough to know really where the leverage points are. We're a fairly choice-friendly state. We have open enrollment, we have charter schools, we have online schools, we have lots of options. And it's often the case that if a child's not thriving in one context, he or she can find another one in which they will thrive. And so it's essential that our kids are learning in a context that helps them fulfill their potential and where our values are being upheld as families and parents. So I would just encourage people to stay engaged and encourage folks that have kids to take advantage of the choices that are available so that we have a lot of competition in the system. All boats rise, including traditional public schools. Great, can we give our panelists a round of applause? <laughs> Very helpful, thank you. As we close here, I just want to recognize a few people that are in the audience. We do have a member of the Board of Trustees here at Colorado Christian University. Dr. Jerry Nelson, can you please stand up? Let's give him a round of applause. He's helping lead a wonderful organization here. Did I miss any other board members? 
Any other board members in the house? Well, thank you, Dr. Nelson, for coming out. I also want to recognize Pam Benigno with the Independence Institute. Um, we're not the only think tank that works on education. There's a lot of us that work on education issues. But one of the very best uh, is Pam Benigno with the Independence Institute. Can you stand so people can get us a chance to meet you? Great work. So thank you very much. And I also want to recognize our wonderful staff who helps put this on. You know, we host the Western Conservative Summit, one of the largest gatherings uh, in the country of conservatives. And the summit executive producer is in the back, folks, Stacy Holt. Uh, she helps put this all on, and she helped put this on tonight. So thank you very much. Uh, and then our $1776, thank you. Um, we do uh, have our next uh, lecture series will be in combination with the president's office. And so we call it the President's Lecture Series. It'll be February 18th, back here in this room. Are we in Anschutz? We're back here. Uh, it'll be, we'll be hearing from Dr. Thomas Kidd on the faith of Benjamin Franklin. You thought he might have just been a deist, but there's more to the story. So I hope you'll join us 7 p.m. back in this room on February 18th. Thank you all. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Thank you.